If you're tired of arguing with strangers on the internet, try talking with one of them in real life. Welcome to Back in America, the podcast. I'm Stan Bertolo, and this is Back in America, a podcast exploring America's identity, culture, and values. This episode was originally recorded live. You can watch the entire interview on our YouTube channel. My guest today was VP of Marketing at Merrill Lynch for 13 years before leaving her job to dedicate her life to her teenage son who was struggling with severe depression. After battling this disease for three long years, her son committed suicide. It was then Tricia's turn to combat depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Help came from her dog, Mickey. Today, we hear from Tricia Baker, the ex Mary Lynch VP, who is now dedicating her life to training dogs and preventing suicide. Welcome to Back in America, Tricia. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me today. Thank you for being here. So you've got an amazing story that we are going to discover in a minute. Tell us what it is you do today. So I wear two hats today. So I uh, teach and run a small dog training business called 20 Paws, where I really uh, uh, enjoy because I'm able to connect with those humans who love their dogs. And I'm able to give them guidance on how to enhance their relationship with their dog. And then the other hat I wear is I run a nonprofit called Attitudes in Reverse or AIR, and we educate youth about mental health and suicide prevention. And one of the really important parts of all of our programming in Attitudes in Reverse is our AIR dogs, our therapy dogs. Dogs go into schools with us for every program, and we are currently uh, certifying therapy dogs. We're a nationally recognized therapy dog group recognized by the American Kennel Club. And we are certifying school staff so that schools can have dogs on premises because we know the benefit that uh, that's received when we interact with dogs. When you look at a dog, it re releases oxytocin. When you interact or pet a dog, it releases serotonin, dopamine, and lowers your cortisol level, your stress hormone. hormone. So there's all these wonderful benefits that happen when you interact with a dog and our hope is to be able to bring those benefits and those dogs to into more and more schools for students. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you are extremely well positioned to know the benefits of, of dogs. Yeah. We are going to talk of a story which uh, is a difficult one. So I want to, to warn our audience that we are going to talk about mental health issues. We are going to talk about depression and we are going to talk about suicide. And that's what happened to you. You were sleeping and your husband came to your bed and told you that your son had committed suicide. Yeah, yeah. Kenny struggled for over three years and we tried really hard to help him get well and we just weren't able to find the right answers for him. And unfortunately, in May 19th, 2009, he lost all hope that he was ever going to be healthy. And he lost all hope that he was ever going to be normal. All he wanted to be was just like everybody else. And he did. Sadly, he ended his life by suicide. And after he died, I have to say, I, I was affected by uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and grief and depression. And days I didn't want to get out of bed because it's really hard to lose a child and not only lose a child, but also watch your child slipping down a dark hole where you know that it's, it, it feels so hopeless and you just can't get them the help that they need. So I, um, as I said, I, I found it really hard to function after he died and I'd stay in bed, I'd sleep. And my little dog, Mickey, who was about a year old at the time, he knew when I needed to sleep. But then he also knew I needed to get up and I needed to, to function again. So what he would do every morning when I didn't get out of bed, he would literally lay on my chest and he'd lick my eyelids until Whoa. 
I got up and I have to tell you, he never did that before. And once I was able to get up every day, he hasn't done it since. He knew I needed to get up and, and to function in my day. And I had to find that strength within myself. And he helped me do that. And how would you react to the dog at first? I mean, were you surprised? I mean, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, when you are depressed, you don't want anybody to right. just annoy you. Go away, right? Go away, pull the covers up. But he was persistent. He knew that I needed to get up. He knew from my own well-being, I needed to get up and to function. So he, he kept at it. And uh, I would get up and he'd be happy and we'd start our day. And, um, you know, I, as a dog trainer, you know, I, I work with dogs and dogs make you happy. And it was, it felt good. In fact, I actually went back to work four days after my son died as a dog trainer. And it was probably the best thing that I could have done because I was around dogs and I was around people who love their dogs. And it was allowed me to find some 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 joy in my life that I was able then to help people, you know, f uh, with this connection with their dog. I was able to help them smile with their dogs. Um, I always say, you know, the best way of helping yourself is by helping someone else. And I, as a dog trainer, I was helping these people build this relationship with their dogs. And it, it just, it came back to me in a positive way. You told me of how you would take your son on a ride. Kenny struggled with severe anxiety and depression. And his anxiety was probably the most challenging for him. He would tell me that the thoughts would go through his head so fast that he could not slow them down. He could not think clearly. But how he was able to slow them down was by movement, by, by walking or by traveling, driving in a car. So, you know, I wasn't going to let my son who was struggling with depression and suicidal ideation go in a car by himself. So we would drive together and we actually drove all over New Jersey. We, you know, sometimes we'd be gone two or three hours just driving. We connected and I always said he was more than, you know, my son. I loved him so dearly, but he was also my friend. We talked about so many different things on those drives And that after he died, the place that I missed him the most was in the car. It felt so lonely. And now, again, my dog was never going to replace my son. But what I started doing so I didn't feel so lonely was I started bringing my little dog, Mickey, everywhere with me. And that was the start of Attitudes in Reverse. And what we did in the beginning was we would go to community events. We'd set up a table. And what we found was that nobody wanted to talk about mental health issues or suicide. You know, they'd walk up to the table, they'd see what we were all about, and they would walk away. Some of them would almost run away for fear that, you know, that they might catch something. Well, this is just stigma. People not understanding that mental health disorders are no different than any other biological illness. And that was one of the things we wanted to share. But what started happening was because I brought Mickey everywhere with me, Mickey started going to all of these events with us and he'd sit on the table or I'd hold him in my arms and people would walk up to pet the dog and people would walk up to ask questions about Mickey. And then they'd share stories about their own dogs. And after about 10 minutes or so talking dogs, they'd ask, what does air mean? And What air means is mental illness is like air. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. It's all around us. And then once we broke that barrier of stigma through the conversation of the dogs, nine out of 10 people stayed and they shared their own personal story. Either they themselves or a loved one, a family member or a neighbor, someone, everybody knows someone. You know, and it wasn't until we talked about the dogs that people felt safe sharing what their story was. So the dogs bring back, bring down that barrier of stigma. And I'm really proud to say Mickey earned an award from the American Kennel Club in 2011 is the top therapy dog award in the country that year. 
It's the Award of Canine Excellence. And it's because of the work that he did with our nonprofit, because we were able to reach out and to talk to so many people because of him, because of him allowing us to talk openly and to break down stigma. Talk to us about some of the programs you do with dogs. So we do a lot with dogs. Uh, we have mental health education programs and suicide prevention programs. And every one of the programs involves dogs. You know, what we do is we'll talk to middle schoolers and high schoolers about mental health and suicide prevention. Those are really tough topics. And we always want to make sure that after every presentation, that we always have time for the students to come up and interact with the dogs. And just like I said earlier, sometimes, you know, the dogs will break down stigma. So those students will come up and they'll interact with one of our volunteers and their dog. And all of our volunteers, we ask them to be youth mental health first aid certified. So if they hear something, they're going to say something to a counselor. So sometimes students will tell a dog something that they wouldn't share with a human being for fear of judgment, but they'll tell the dog. So we want to make sure that we're hearing those messages and that we're then able to connect that student with the counselor. We also run some programs for uh, elementary students. And uh, the newest program that we're just rolling out, it's all about dogs and emotions. And the whole idea is that You know, as a dog trainer and as a mental health advocate, I, the more and more I started, started to study dog behavior, the more and more I started to understand that there's so much similarity between dog behavior and human behavior. So it's all about study, talking about dog emotions. The program's called Mickey and Friends Go to School. And we talk about dogs and their emotions and how they might respond to different situations in school. And what, what the children will start to realize is that, you know, dogs are not very different and they might start to see either themselves or their friends in some of these situations that we're talking about with Mickey and his friends. And it can start to open up a conversation where they realize that, well, it's not just me and it's not just my friend. And that there are adults out there who are willing to listen and who can help us through some of these situations. We talk a lot about the safe, trusted adult, uh, but we don't want children to feel put on the spot. So we talk about dogs. Right. And yeah, just the few trials that we've done with this program, it's been very, very receptive. Do you have any um, feedback regarding the impact of the COVID pandemic on mental health? Uh, it's scary. Um, I don't know if everyone's realized or have heard, but uh, just in, um, in Clark County in Nevada, they've had 18 youth suicides in nine months. And one of those was a nine-year-old. Wow. So, yeah, I just, um, and what people have to understand is that our young people are now living through trauma. This is trauma. They are fearful. I've seen children crying Uh, before entering a school building, fearful that uh, they're going to be exposed to the illness, fearful that they're going to die, fearful that if they leave their parents, their parents are going to die. Uh, trauma. And trauma can take up to 10 years for it to have an impact on a human's emotions. So, you know, everyone might be back to school in, in say, March or maybe it's September. I don't know. Everybody, you know, schools are different. Districts are different. States are different. Um, But we're going to be living with this for a really long time, and we're going to see a significant impact on our children. And, um, and I think we have to keep our eyes open as professionals and be ready to, to provide them the support that, that they're going to need. Hmm. So I want to go back to your life. You told us how everything has changed after the death of your son, the suicide of your son. You told us how Mickey saved your life by stepping in to be there for you and, and how you created uh, those um, nonprofits uh, that help young people with suicide prevention and mental health issue. But 
Your life has not always been that. Obviously, uh, you have not always been a dog trainer. Tell us about what you did before that. Uh, I'm a mom who uh, watched her child struggle, and I've learned a lot, and I take that forward with me. So I am a certified professional dog trainer. I went to school. I went to college for, uh, to be a graphic designer, and I worked in the graphics industry for a while. And then I was offered a position at Merrill Lynch uh, in Princeton uh, to run the graphic design studio. And from there, I was promoted to uh, vice president of marketing, which I really enjoyed. I got a lot from it. I managed five departments uh, at that time. I managed well over 100 people. And it, it taught me a lot about, about people. And um, what happened, and, I, and I'm a big believer that life takes us on a journey and that uh, sometimes we just have to keep our eyes open as to what that journey might be. You know, my children both had learning disabilities so I watched them struggling and I watched them as, as a mom and as a, an employee and as a wife. I started seeing myself not being successful in any of those areas. I mean, I, 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 I was successful, but not as successful as I wanted to be. So I made a really tough decision um, to leave my position at Merrill Lynch because I wanted to be able to spend more time helping my children with their learning disabilities, helping making sure that they got, you know, the education that was appropriate for them. And right after I left Merrill, my mom got sick on Long Island. So that opened up a whole nother um, door of, of where I was needed. And, uh, but I, what I tell s students when I talk to them is that no matter what path your life takes you, you're gonna learn things. And all of those things that you learn, you're going to bring with you into the next phase of your life. You know, every bit of, of knowledge that I, I learned as a, a manager at Merrill Lynch, I know I brought forth uh, with me. And that's what's allowed me, you know, to start Attitudes in Reverse and to start our 20 Paws dog training program. You know, I've learned a lot about customer service um, through working at Merrill Lynch. Um, you know, I just said, we take what we learn and we bring that forth with us and it enhances the next phase in our life. Mm. And, and that's just kind of how I, I keep looking at things. Nothing is ever a waste of time. Everything that we do, we learn from it. Uh, even our failures, we learn from them. You know, I, I sure. don't even think of them as failures. I just think of them as learning experiences. And, uh, you know, we just, we help that, you know, bring that forward and it helps us en enhance the next step. Yeah. Do you ever miss your corporate life and the paycheck no. every 15 days? And No. So the thing I've learned is that um, we really don't need that much in life to be happy. And the amount of stress that I was under in corporate America, I didn't realize how much stress it was until I left it. And I realized, too, that I never, ever could have been able to support Kenny in his illness if I was still working at Merrill Lynch at the time that we found out his diagnosis. There was no way because, you know, he would see doctors four, four times a week. He would see, um, you know, he would see therapists. He would see a psychi psychologist, psychiatrist. Um, and in addition, because of uh, side effects to medication, he would see dermatologists. He would see eye doctors. He would have to go for blood tests, you know. So he had so much medical stuff going on. There's no way that I could have held a, a corporate job and and provided support for him and all that he needed at the time of of his illness, of his struggle. Yeah. Do you have any suggestion, recommendation, advice for people whose children are, are struggling with depression or might have uh, had uh, suicide? So, well, I do believe everyone who is struggling, they need to know they're not alone. They need to know that there is help out there. There are so many people who are willing to listen and to, to provide support. So the, um, it's important, the crisis text line number, the crisis text line is, uh, you can text the word AIR, A-I-R, to 741741, and that's a national crisis uh, hotline number. 
And within minutes, you'll get a response from a trained certified counselor. And the crisis, national crisis phone number is 1-800-273-TALK, T-A-L-K. So whether you text or talk, within minutes, you'll get a certified counselor on the other end willing to listen. You know, there's so many people who do want to help. So reach out. Now, the, the, one of the main messages I share with people is, and this is really, really important because it's, it's kind of clarifying a misunderstanding. You know, we, we always say that, you know, when we, someone dies by suicide, you know, why didn't they reach out? I was here. I would help. Why didn't they ask? Well, it's important to understand that people who are living with these mental health issues, you know, their brains are, are not healthy and their brains are lying to them. And their brains are telling them that their family, their friends and the world would be better off without them. You know, their brains are lying to them and telling them that they don't deserve help. And that's why it's so critical for those of us who have healthy brains and who start to see some of these signs, reach out and say, Howling. And it's okay to say, are you thinking about hurting yourself? By saying that, you're not going to put that thought into somebody's mind. All right. If it's there, they might just reach out and they might say, you know what? Yes, I am. The first day that Kenny went to the hospital, I had no, I had no idea. I have to tell you, I had no idea what he was struggling with. I had no idea, you know, as a parent, what he, you know, what he was going through. And then I did talk to a friend who was a, a child psychologist and she said, bring him to the hospital. And I didn't ask really any questions, but I did say to Kenny that day, I said, Kenny, let's go, we're going to the hospital. He got up and he walked with me. We got into the car. There was no argument. He knew he needed help. He did not know how to ask for that help. He needed somebody to say, Let's go get that help. So this is really, really important because so many people die by suicide the first time that they make an attempt without ever once, never once ever asking for help. So it's up to the rest of us in the community to understand that those who are struggling, they're not going to reach out. And it's up to us to ask them. And it's even okay for us to say, are you thinking about killing yourself? You know, before, you know, five years ago, we might have thought, well, if you're not thinking about killing our, yourself by saying that question, we're putting the thought in your head. The thoughts are there. By asking those tough, tough questions, it gives that person permission to ask for help and to reach out and just say yes and, and to get help. And just to know that there are so many people out there willing to help. I come across, you know, different organizations, different people every single day who, you know, either they're paid staff or they're volunteers who want to help, you know, because people care. People who've lived with mental health issues, it makes them extremely empathetic. I find that people who have mental health issues tend to be some of the kindest people that I know because they understand, they understand the emotional pain and the physical pain that can go along with these mental health issues. And, and they, they offer kindness and empathy and compassion. So just know that there are people out there who really truly want to help. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure it has and will help a lot of people. Yeah. Tricia, we're getting at the end of this interview thank you again for sharing your story a very very tough story thank you for telling us how your dog mickey has just helped you and probably saved your life and is now um how is mickey doing mickey is good he's probably sleeping somewhere mickey woo -woo, come here come here you come here mickey's getting older mickey is so tell us about mickey what what, what breed is he there how old he is. is he there he is, my little man. Mickey is a Pomeranian. He's a party colored Pomeranian. He's almost 13 years old. So he is a senior. Yeah. And he's semi retired. So he doesn't really go to schools very much anymore. But uh, he's just an amazing dog. He, I, we have five dogs in our family. 
but I always say he's my heart dog. There's just something special about Mickey and the connection that he and I have that um, it's different than the connection that I have with the other dogs. And uh, so yeah. he's just a, a special, special little man. So, well, I mean, I understand that after saving your life, you might have developed yeah. a special relationship yeah. with him. Yeah. He's, he's yawning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I started saying that dogs were part of American culture. Uh, yes. And the question I always ask is, what is America to you? For me, I think America is the greatest country in the world. You know, I think about all the opportunities that I myself have been offered. You know, my my history is my grandparents came to America with nothing. You know, my grandmother came on a ship when she was 16 without a job, without a home, without, without family, without friends, with, with nothing, you know, my grandfather as well. And, you know, my, my parents themselves, they lived through the depression and, uh, but they were still able to offer me the opportunity of an education. And with that education, then I was able to, you know, work at Merrill, get that job at Merrill, which gave me the opportunity to start the nonprofit and start our business. And I just think that it's, um, it's the best country that we have so many opportunities. We just have to keep our eyes open to what those opportunities are. And I just, uh, I think dogs, uh, I applaud everyone who got a dog during the pandemic. I think it's the best thing Uh, there was a shortage of dogs, believe it or not, during the pandemic. There's shortage of puppies because everybody was getting one. And I think it's the best thing because they help us smile. They um, will, you know, distract our, our negative thoughts and give us positive thoughts. And the one wonderful thing I think is that everybody loves dogs. So it's one of the unifying things that uh, we can all agree on, I think, in the country at this time, that we all love our dogs. Yes, absolutely. Well, yeah. Tricia, thank you so much for uh, your heart-touching story, for sharing it with us. Thank you for being so open. And uh, I wish you a good day. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to share the story. So thank you. You have a great day as well. Thank you for listening. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe to Back in America and please share it with your friends, and with your family. I want to shout out to Josh Wagner, our intern, who is just publishing amazing episodes. Make sure you listen to his latest episode on being Jewish in the US in 2021. And stay tuned for upcoming episodes of Back in America. We are going to be looking at witches and feminism. Talking of witches, have you read the latest article in our newsletter? Make sure you subscribe to Back in America, the newsletter. You will find a link on this episode's note. Goodbye and have a fantastic day.